Hi, welcome to Let's Talk Shop. I'm Brandon Wagner, and I'm one of the sales managers for our infrastructure product group. And I'm Spencer Emick. I'm also one of the sales managers for our infrastructure core product group. I'm Jeff Szynski, a regional sales manager with Vermeer MB Solutions. Uh, today, we want to spend some time discussing uh, things specific to the fiber industry. So we want to go through kind of specifically what size of drill uh, crews should use for different types of fiber work. Uh, when's the appropriate time to maybe use a small vibratory plow, trencher for some residential work? Um, what options are available for more installs at longer distances? And then also hit on some of our kind of niche product offerings. So micro trenchers, piercing tools, vacuum excavation, and kind of where they fit in this whole fiber market. So first topic we want to hit on. So obviously we know kind of drills have been the most preferred method for fiber installation, uh, with the majority of the work being in the more urban kind of more tight, uh, tight quarter installations. Um, but one thing we want to talk about is, you know, what should contractors be thinking about when it comes to sizing their machines for a specific job? So I would say they need to be thinking about, you know, what are the distances that they're wanting to install through and what the diameter of that installation is. And then really the next question is, how much room do you have to set your machine or your equipment up uh, correctly? So what is the width? What's the length? What's the, the setback distance required as well? Um, and then the thing that I think a lot of people potentially overlook, especially when they're, they're at the stage of looking for that next piece of equipment is what auxiliary equipment needs to go with it as well. So if you go from a small drill to a medium drill to a large drill, you're looking at potentially a different truck, a different trailer, different mix system, different crew size, whatever that may be. So, you know, there's not necessarily a one size fits all answer to what is the best size drill rig. Yeah, and I think another, I mean, another question that too is not even what size drill, but is a drill even the most cost effective way um, to install this product? So looking at utilities in the area, looking at how long of a shot it is, you know, when does right. it make sense to use those different pieces on there too? Yeah, because like what Spencer was saying is, you know, a lot of the things to look at, product size, uh, you know, distance, things like that. Um, you know, if a job site dictates being set up in a certain uh, size constraint um, you might not be able to fit what, what drill you have in that space so then you're going to have to set back farther and then therefore your pay length you know is still going to be the same but you're going to have to drill farther so you know that power to footprint ratio you know that's that's pretty important so trying to get the most power and the smallest footprint possible you know can really help out contractors when they're when they're bidding these jobs and looking at all these different jobs yeah. that's a, also understanding what's the flexibility of your drill rods mm -hmm. so you know what what sort of Bend radius can you get and what are your expectations, you know, as far as depth and steerability? Right. Yeah, because, you know, and then the product size, when we're talking about uh, different product size, um, you know, you could, um, if you're talking about a 12 inch pipe, you know, uh, over say a hundred feet, there's a lot of different options you could use there. But then if you're talking, you know, a four inch pipe going a greater distance, then, the, you know, the smaller drill might not be your fit. So you really got to look at, you know, size of diameter and length. And, and then obviously ground conditions is, is, a, is a huge factor as well. Uh, so along with that, there's, you know, obviously we've talked about the different sizes of, you know, what size drill do you want to use, what type of work you're doing. But I think a lot of question we get all the time is, is there one drill specifically that's kind of that Swiss Army knife that can do it all? And I mean, short answer is no, but I don't right, know. Yeah, right, Again, yeah. it's kind of the... The short answer is no. Yeah, there's no one drill that'll fit uh, every scenario. But um, if we're, if you know, if we're sp specifically talking about fiber, um, fiber installations, things like that, fiber of the home, I mean, you know, the, the D8, the D10 um, are, are they're great power to footprint ratio in that small package that can kind of get into those tight spaces. Um, and then you've got, you know, the, the D20, the D23 by 30, um, which is also, those are great power in, the, in footprint because then you actually carry more rods. So now you have more distance that you can actually cover. Um, and then, you know, the S3 controls, you know, if you've got to switch operators from one to one to another, um, that's, that's a huge advantage as well. And that's the whole point of doing it, right? Because we recognize there's not one drill that's going to do it all. Right. So it's, we need to have operators, especially in the labor market that we're in, right? We need to have one operator. You can run a 10, 15 today. You can run a 40, 55 tomorrow. Right. And it's more of the learning is how do I drill and with that larger rig, the bigger diameter. Mm -hmm. It's not how do I run the drill rig. And, and that answer can change regionally as well. Yeah. So if you think of, if somebody came to you and said, you know, what's the best drill to install 250 feet of two inch product, yeah. 
that answer in Pella, Iowa, where, where Vermeer Corporation is at, is different than it would be in Phoenix, Arizona. So I, there's some important opportunities to have conversations with a local dealer and their HDD specialists on, you know, what their knowledge of the ground conditions are, how, you know, other contractors have performed similar jobs in that area too. So we've talked about a little bit. So we talked about power footprint. We talked about different applications for the drills, but is there really anything else that a, you know, an operator, foreman, crew should really think about when they're trying to figure out what machine do I need on the job site? I would say drilling fluid is something that can't be overlooked. So volume and additives. So understanding how the, how the ground's going to react with whatever you put down the down the drill rod is a, is a huge thing to consider. Mm -hmm. And then you know with the today with the urban areas that you know a lot of contractors are working in um, residential areas things like that they got to have a, you know they got to be thinking about mud management too right so um, you know they got to be able to clean up the drill fluid. They got to be able to do, you know, uh, potholing and daylighting, things like that. But then, um, you know, the disposal of the mud and things like that, you know, they got to have a plan to keep the most important thing is to keep the drill running and keep it installing products. So what is going to help, you know, keep that process going? So, you know, those are a lot of things that sometimes they get overlooked. So we've kind of, again, we've talked about drilling because that's been the, I, wanna, I don't want to say accepted method, but with the latest fiber build that's been going through. It's been in a lot more urban areas, a lot more congested areas. But now with the latest package, the infrastructure package that's gone through and looking at more fiber installs to rural communities, areas that, you know, everyone being home kind of exposed some weaknesses in the in the network. You know, what type of things do we need to keep in mind as we transition, I don't want to say totally away from drills, but as we start seeing some more plow work going on for fiber specifically, I guess what type of things do contractors need to keep in mind when doing fiber installs? You know, I would say everything that you've listed. So, um, you know, what is the, what's the local environment like? What's the job site look like? Um, is a drill the appropriate tool? Um, you know, the, the answer, the answers can be as diverse as, you know, any, any of those things. Again, it really depends on the job too, right? It's, if we're in a rural area where I don't have to worry about utilities being right underneath me, or I don't have to worry about getting underneath or above, you know, can I just plow it in or right. can I just trench it in? Because that's yeah. going to save me a lot of time. It's going to be a little more cost effective yeah. uh, than drilling everything. Right. And some of the same questions that we ask when we're talking about, you know, directional drilling, you know, and now if we're switching gears and we're, you know, out, um, you know, cross country uh, putting in fiber where plowing might be an option, you know, we need to, what product size, you know, what minimum depth do we have to be, you know, is there... Uh, is there a lot of driveways and, and, you know, roads that need to be crossed? So then, then you're going to have to have a mix of, you know, maybe trenchless applications and then, you know, obviously with the drilling. Um, and then, you know, maybe even trenching, maybe trenching is, is more, more suited for, for that application, just depending on, you know, like what Spencer said, if now all of a sudden we get into uh, a rural environment, but it's solid rock, you know, we're, you know, we might have to switch to a, an actual, you know, rock saw or, uh, you know, a larger, trencher. Yeah. And just like you said, it's, I mean, same thing as drilling, right? It's ground yeah. condition. Correct. If it's a rock shot, I'm either using a 40 DR or 23 DR. And on my plow side, I'm not plowing it in because I'm not going to pull anything through rock. I right. use a trencher, a rock wheel, something of that nature. Right. Um, and I think that's a big thing, again, to keep in mind too, is we're looking at the different sizes of plows, not just, you know, is it a short shot, a long shot? Also, what type of ground are you in? Yeah. Right. right. If, I, if I'm in hard ground and I, I know I'm going to have some rock, I'm not going to grab an RTX 450. I'm going to stick to that 750, 1250 to really get good production on the rock wheel. Right. And then, you know, like then you start looking at quad tracks, you know, what's the ground conditions actually like? Um, so if, you know, you've got to be down in that um, that ditch next to the next to the country road, you know, where it's it's wet a lot of times they. Um, they got to keep production going. So, you know, the quads is a, is a great option to, for, you know, for traction and for stability and, and, and for production. So, um, you know, things like that to, to consider as well. And you know, we've touched on it a little bit, but so we're starting to lay the, obviously the backbone of this fiber network. So as we start to see contractors, you know, focusing on laying the fiber backbone, ton of work involved in connecting each and every home to that network, you know, how should contractors really go about um, this type of work to really maximize the efficiency of their crews? Um, yeah, so there's a there's a lot of things um, you know in in our in our world when we go see um, contractors in the field. You know what um, 
what could what could help them be more productive, you know, and I and I think, you know, number one, you know, job site job site planning, board planning, um, you know, actually trying to put your eyes on the the actual physical location of where you're where you need to be. And so that way it kind of gives you an idea of what, you know, where am I going to park my trailer? Where can I park my vac? Where can, you know, where can I set the drill? Things like that. So having the plan laid out for that um, will help set, you know, set yourself up for success, right? So to try to eliminate that and then having a plan so that you can tell your your crew or your foreman or whatever, what you expect and, and you know, kind of what your vision is. And then that way it'll help you be more productive. Yeah, I think that's something that's, super critical too. You want the crews to know what the plan is because, you know, if the foreman or the supervisor is on another job, mm-hmm. they're going to they're going to have to make critical decisions at some point, so they need to know what the what the ultimate goal is and when they can continue and when they need to stop or whatever that right situation is. Yeah, and I, and you know, and in today's market with the with the way the labor shortage is and things like that that there's a lot of um, you know, the foremans might have several jobs going on. And so, you know, if, if, if maybe they could even have like a pre-meeting with the crew that's going to do the job, kind of walk them through it that way, um, that'll, that'll help save them as well, save, save some time as well. Um, and then, you know, maybe, you know, something else to be, uh, to help with efficiency might be like, you know, a separate crew for daylighting, for daylighting utilities, having somebody out in front um, that's actually, doing verifying um where utilities are you know getting all that laid out getting those exposed and then when the drill shows up you know it's ready to go we're not waiting on you know we're not waiting on this crew to to finish work it's it's try to keep the try to keep everybody uh you know busy trying to keep that workflow going we've talked so we talked a lot about big plows we talked a lot about drills but you know, at a certain point, you know, people always think, you know, bigger is faster. I can get more stuff in the ground with a bigger drill. But when do, you know, small, well, kind of two-part question, but when do smaller drills or smaller tractors kind of have their place on the job site? Maybe even separate from both of those, when should we be looking at, you know, even smaller vibratory plows or, you know, Jeff, I know you're familiar with like piercing tools. Mm -hmm. So when should we really be focusing on those kind of the smaller pieces and maybe even some starting to get into kind of niche product? Um, yeah, so the you know the smaller the smaller side of it, the small lawn plows and things like that is you know if it, it all kind of depends on what's in the ground and and if we're if we're not going to have to go around a lot of utilities things like that um, that can be a great option. It's 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 quick. Um, they can get into tight spaces and get into the backyards, um, do those drops uh, relatively quickly. Um, you know, piercing tools can be a great option if. Um, you know, if you have to cross, um, say sidewalks, driveways, uh, things like that, even, um, duck banks or something like that, where you can, you know, physically, uh, give yourself two, two pits and then you don't have room to set up a large, or I'm saying set up a a drill, you know, even a smaller drill, maybe just don't have that room. A piercing tool can, can be a great option, you know, to get into those backyards, Um, literally, if you can carry the tool into the backyard, you know, you can, you can basically get your job done that way. Well, I think the the same thing, another thing to consider there too, is how many jobs do you want those smaller pieces of equipment to complete a day? And it goes back to the planning conversation we just had of, you know, how do you prioritize where your small equipment is used versus your large equipment? And can you get five or six service shots done before the main crew comes in? And then when you shift gears to the larger stuff, you know, whether it's a, a large drill or an RTX 1250i2 type machine, you know, the the efficiency of those machines comes from letting them get out and go and, yep. you know, not not having interruptions and stopping and slowing down because of uh, things that may, may be in their way. So right. when you look at how, how those, those pieces of equipment are used versus, you know, their smaller counterparts, you need to think about, you know, time commitment and flexibility in, in job site too. I think some of it too is even job site uh, restrictions even right so if mm-hmm. you know if i can only close one half of the street at a time i'm not going to bring a 4055 out there right um and same thing like spence said where i want to get a lot of shots done at once so smaller drills more compact curb the house get it done pull it back or yard plows mm-hmm. so just run the product to the house and get a lot of those runs done in a short period um to your point exactly you know if i want to do the bigger trunk lines i have the bigger product to do that but those small machines are really there for those curb to house installations So again, kind of keep it on that pace of uh, kind of that niche equipment. So we're starting to see, especially in cities, uh, underground right-of-ways are getting really crowded. 
Uh, so one thing we've kind of seen, I want to say a little bit of resurgence with is that micro trenching. So I don't know, Spence, if you want to talk about maybe a little bit micro trenching when it's a good option to consider any recent innovations, anything that we're working on from that aspect. Yep. So micro trenching is an ideal option if, you know, the, the cut of product installation needs to be narrow and relatively shallow. So to the point we've made a few different times of trying to stay potentially above pre-existing utilities, you know, micro trenching excels when, you know, a majority of the material being cut is a is an asphalt based product. Um, and it, it performs very well in those small, tighter radius installations. You know, where, where we see challenges are, you know, the longer distance applications with potentially a wider cut, you know, and we are working on some options to, uh, to alleviate that industry problem as well. So, you know, micro trenching in general is going to require potentially less road closures, but some uh, additional equipment in a, in a back or a back truck to go along with that application. Yeah, I think the other thing with micro trenching to keep in mind is just what are what are you really cutting, right? Correct. Is it is it purely asphalt? Is it purely you know what's underneath it as an aggregate? Is it hard rock? Is it sand? That you know again, it, it really has its place when it's a crowded. You want to be above existing utilities or even you want to be in the the curb you know between the curb and the street right where you know there's no utility so but again it, it definitely has its place it's just more of figuring out where it fits in um so total niche area and i know jeff kind of your specialty mm -hmm. but another thing so same line of questioning so another option that contractors have started exploring is that hydro trenching mm -hmm. so again it's uh, we know there's utilities there we're gonna have to cross them you yeah. want to kind of go through maybe yeah. how figuring out if hydro trenching is a really good option and then also kind of what con what you're seeing from contractors in terms of how they're using it. Uh, yeah, so uh, hydro trenching um, seems to be gaining a little bit more popularity, I guess, um, you know, in the in the the areas where you have high congestion of utilities. OK, so um, you have just a massive amount of utilities and you have to basically daylight them. Um, on one end and then another, and say that there's only 30 feet between the two points where we just expose the utilities and that's where we have to go, then contractors are saying, well, I have the vac here, I have the, you know, I have the room um, capacity in my debris body, so why don't I just, you know, connect the two holes and then I can, you know, put my utility in. That's what I see a, a lot more contractors are, are, are kind of using that approach as far as they have to bring in a vac to, to locate utilities. And then by the time then my, my vac leaves and I go get my, you know, mini, mini excavator or, you know, trencher or something like that, I could probably just go ahead and connect these two, these two pits. And so that can be just a great option. Now, hydro trenching might not be always the best fit just for distance wise, right? I mean, that's where you get into, maybe it'd be better with a, you know, a small lawn plow or small, trencher in the right of way or something to that but hydro trenching um in some of these areas um is 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 gaining popularity especially these um you know these small water services where they have to go in and look for you know they have to go in and look for lead line from the from the water uh shut off to the house well that in these older neighborhoods it might only be 25 30 feet so why don't we just go ahead and just dig the rest of the way and then they can tear out the the lead line replace it um, instead of, you know, having to shut down the street and then, then leaving, covering up the hole, come back, dig up the, you know, dig up the rest of the way with a mini X or something to that effect, then, you know, we can just get it all done in one shot. So it could be a great, great way to save some, you know, save yourself some time on the job. The other piece of that is overall job site planning too. You know, if you have to shut down for a couple hours to wait for the mini X to show up and you've got four or five people standing on the job site, getting paid to really not put anything in the ground and you can use that tool that's already there to get the job done. And you made a good point that it's not an end all be all solution, but yeah. it's one of those, you know, impactful decisions that a crew needs to make to, yeah, to get and, the job and, done correctly. And to your point, you know, you don't want guys standing around. So if the, if, you know, the piece of equipment that you might need next is over completing another job, you don't want to be standing there waiting for the next one. So why don't we just use the piece of equipment we have and the guys we have, just let's go ahead and get it done and we can just kind of move on. So, And the, it kind of goes back to that first question too. There's really no one Swiss Army knife. This fits every single job. So that's where, you know, hydro trenching is another feather in the cap of, you know, if you have that, if you have the micro trenching, you have the drilling, 
there's all these different things that are really well suited for different you know aspects of it. just figuring out where's the best place to use each one of those right exactly thanks a lot for joining us for this edition of let's talk shop uh, if you have any questions about anything we went over today or any of the products that we mentioned uh, reach out to your local vermeer dealer or go to vermeer.com <laughs>